Singh, a student of second year DME Media School. And I, Yogesh Bist, a student of first year DME Media School. Welcome you all to the session of day two where we are going to have our first panel discussion of the world's first 10-day digital live international conference, ICANN. Despite the global pandemic, DME Media School, in collaboration with School of Communication and Creative Arts, Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia, is holding this most awaited conference internationally through virtual means. We are extremely happy to announce that ICAN4 is supported by Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR. The participation of about 60 eminent scholars from five continents and 11 countries, namely India, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Bangladesh, USA, Mexico, France, Italy, Australia and Ghana. More than 100 media educators, researchers have gathered to present their papers in the conference. There are 36 live sessions scheduled including 9 technical sessions, 3 workshops, 7 panel discussions, 3 special sessions and 10 master classes. And how wonderful it is that all 9 technical sessions are being chaired and co-chaired by women scholars representing different states of the country. DME Media School, in collaboration with School of Communication and Creative Arts, Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia, takes immense pride in staying afoot while working for this day, where we all share screens together to treat us with the most knowledgeable discussions, deliberations and thoughts. I'd like to extend my warm regards towards Spark a special society of students with positive attitude and resonating communication in DME, and also towards journalism at DME, which is the official newsletter of DME Media School. This fortnightly publication covers all the major activities happening in and out the campus. It is a student-centric newsletter carried out entirely by them under the supervision of faculty members. It gives me great pleasure to inform everyone that we are live on our official Facebook page, Stream Now. Now, I would like to request Professor Dr. Amrish Kakena, Dean DME Media School, Director DME Studios and Production, Director International Relations, Delhi Metropolitan Education, please say it is really a matter of uh, great uh, pride and privilege uh, that uh, we are meeting in this session on the second day of ICANN uh, in the evening. Uh, today also, last time, the uh, last evening, the inauguration happened. And from uh, this morning, there have been continuously some of the other sessions. Since morning, we had uh, our uh, master class, or the, rather the special class by Professor Jetwani. And then there was the first technical session and the first uh, a uh, master class uh, on uh, non-fiction filmmaking by Vijay Jodha. So um, uh, in the evening, we are meeting in this session and this is the first panel discussion of the conference. Uh, so there are seven panel discussions as uh, has already been told to you, but this session uh, um, is significant in the sense that it's being organized on a subject, which is, I believe is the most pertinent nowadays since the time the lockdown happened and this coronavirus is struck in uh, the beginning of 2020 and now we are in the middle of 2021 uh, each one of us have been suffering because of this and uh, almost all the countries are affected by covid-19 and this has in fact changed everything uh, the, the whole life has uh, changed our working style has changed and the education has completely changed in our institute, uh, since the time this happened, we have made so many experiments. Obviously, online classes have been happening, but beyond that, we were producing, we, we kept on producing the study material for the students, which we were providing them uh, online uh, through this, uh, this uh, uh, internal system, through uh, emails, etc. And then uh, when the things eased out uh, in the beginning of this year, we were inviting the students in groups, though officially uh, the government had not opened the colleges, but then we, we were inviting students in small groups to meet and interact. And so that something, something could happen in the physical space. But then when the second wave happened, again, we were back to square one and then everything was locked down. And again, we were completely online. 
uh, there is one batch of us who might be appearing in a month or so their second semester examination and for the last one year they have not met us in the college so this kind of situation we all are facing but then uh, this was under compulsion that we adopted this online uh, uh, teaching and learning mode, but then it has own merits and the demerits. So how it has affected us? Obviously, whatever we are using, like this uh, whole meeting, this whole session we are organizing on Zoom. We have been using other platforms as well for classes. We used uh, we use uh, Google Meet, uh, but then for most of the sessions we also use Zoom. But whichever platform we are using, the most important issue that is confronting us, uh, uh, like the screen time, how much time you can sit before the screen, and whether the real learning is happening obviously when you have no option at least this is the best option that we have but whether the real learning happening and what are the hazards available what are the uh, involved and what are the merits involved in this uh, online learning so this very augustus uh, uh, panel is there before us with us and we will be able to learn a perspective of a panelist coming from different countries so a more holistic view will emerge i believe in this and to to moderate and to head this whole panel we have uh, dr jatin shirasta with us who is a senior academic person and researcher and who has always been instrumental in helping us and in uh, pushing or in accelerating any academic venture that is happening. Earlier also, uh, he organized a, a workshop uh, for us uh, on uh, qualitative and quantitative research in uh, DME campus in the physical mode when things were normal in 2019. And this time also, he was very helpful in organizing such kind of panels for the benefit of us all. So I stop here and uh, let us all uh, should uh, wait for listening to our eminent panelists. Thank you all. Thank you, sir, for your insightful words. Well, this panel discussion is on a very crucial topic that we all can relate within today's times. People on Zoom, social implications of online learning. This session is being presided by Ms. Dr. Jatin Srivastav. He is an associate professor and director of the Institute for International Journalism at E.W. Scripps School of Journalism at Ohio University. His recent research is rooted in theory-based exploration of the new media environment and his teaching experience ranges from graduate seminars in mass communication theory and research methods to undergraduate courses on graphic design and media literacy. We also have Dr. Sharon Wilson as one of our panelists. Dr. Sharon Wilson is an assistant professor at Uttar, Malaysia. She holds a PhD in communication from University Kebangsan, Malaysia. She, is, was, she was a well scholar of the study of the United States Institute, Journalism and Media, Program 2013 at Ohio University, and a fellow of the Summer Institute of Asia Fellows in News Literacy Program in Hong Kong in 2020. She received the first place in the International Communications Division teaching competition of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. Her recent research is rooted in the exploration of the new media environment, interactions between media and society. Her research focus is media and crime and women and identity. We are also honored to have Dr. Anand Pradhan as a panelist for the discussion. Dr. Anand Pradhan is a professor of journalism at the Indian Institute of Mass Communication, New Delhi. Presently, he is the course director of Indian Language Journalism in Hindi, program in IIMC. Dr. Anand is an IIMC faculty since 2003. He holds PhD degree in journalism from Banaras Hindu University, BHU, Varanasi. Dr. Pradhan is noted and he regularly writes opinion articles on issues to economy, politics, and media. He has attended many national and international conferences in India and abroad. And we also have Mr. Zakaria among us for our first our final panelist. Mr. Zakaria Tankumusa is a barrister at law. Having been called to the of England and Wales, 
and the Ghana Bar Association, a media law ethics lecturer, journalist, and a political analyst. His research interests are media ethics and law corruption, investigation journalism, community journalism, political communication. He is a private legal pract practitioner, legal consultant for corruption, both an investigative journalist project and a founding member of the African Center for International Law and Accountability, a fellow of the study of the U.S. Institute of Four Scholars on Journalism and Media, hosted by Ohio University, U.S. His previous roles include Legal Counsel, Member of Government Governing Council, Head of Free Journalism Department, and Coordinator of Student Internship Program for GIJ. Internationally, he worked as the Coordinator, Chief Executive Officer of Shield Back Minority, Ethic Network Limited. Board and Brad, Communication Director of Shifa Racial Equality Council and Board Member of Shifa Law Center. He is a member of the Bar Council of England and Wales, Lincoln's Inn, the Association of Muslim Lawyers, Human Rights, Law Association, Communities Association, Society of Legal Scholars, Ghana Bar Association, Ghana Journalist Association, and the University Teachers Association of Ghana. Thank you all for accepting our invitations. Holding this panel discussion, we are pleased to have you here with us. Now I request Dr. Jatin Srivastav to please carry the session forward. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, and thank you, Ishika and uh, Shriya and Yogesh uh, for introducing us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saxena and uh, Dr. Bala. It's great to uh, see you again uh, uh, virtually. Uh, we have Anand and uh, uh, so, uh, so in the panel today, we will keep it very informal. We will use first names. Uh, uh, Dr. Anand Pradhan, Anand, uh, Dr. Sharon, Sharon, Mr. Jakaria, we'll call him Zach. Uh, so that will uh, keep things easy. Uh, now, it, I'm, I'm very, very glad to see uh, uh, both students and uh, teachers here because what we are going to talk about involves the lives of both students and teachers. And it would be great, it would be wonderful if students could, and both, you know, teachers are also welcome uh, to, uh, you know, provide your feedback through the chat window. Okay. Uh, as we are talking, as we are discussing different issues, please feel free to share your life experiences, ask questions, interact with us. We would be very, very interested in hearing how you are experiencing uh, online education during this uh, time of pandemic. So thank you all the students for being here. Uh, thank you for all the students who decided to switch on their cameras. You know, uh, I have become used to, uh, you know, to teaching classes with the switched off cameras. And that is one of the things we dread uh, a lot, I believe, you know, most teachers. So this is the new world. We are forming relationships uh, because there's no other ways or the usual way to form relationships is kind of gone. And these new relationships are formed using some kind of media platforms. Okay. And, and these platforms are a thing in themselves. So they change the way we, you know, we do things. Okay. So this is what we will talk about. Till now, a lot of focus has been on, on performance in online education, how much students are learning, how well they are learning, how well teachers are teaching. But there are a lot of other things happening. You know, this is a new classroom. This is a new world where people are interacting differently. So we will focus on social implications uh, to a large extent and issues related to ethics and maybe uh, potential legal challenges. And that's why it's, uh, you know, it's great to have uh, Zach here with us. So without any further ado, I would invite uh, each panelist to uh, talk a bit about himself how he or she connects to the online uh, education environment and anything he or she wants to discuss. You know, so a very brief introduction and how you connect to the uh, online teaching environments. We will start with Anand and go to Sharon and then finally we would invite Zach to introduce himself. So uh, starting with Anand. Thanks, Jatin. Thanks, Dr. Ambrish and uh, Sharon and Jack. Uh, I think uh, I'm already introduced, uh, but uh, 
I teach at Indian Institute of Mass Communication. Uh, I, you know, I hold some uh, administrative responsibility as well, but I think uh, primarily I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, uh, it was, a, you know, really a, a, a life-changing experience for me uh, uh, when, uh, you know, pandemic struck. Uh, you know, India went to uh, lockdown for two months. Our session was on. And at that time, uh, we were, you know, completely clueless how to deal with that situation. Uh, because pandemic was, you know, once in a century uh, event. Uh, <clears throat> so what happened, you know, uh, uh, somehow we managed uh, through email and WhatsApp because those digital tools were there. And so initially through emails and through, you know, uh, WhatsApp and later on through Zoom and then, uh, you know, Google Meet and many other platforms we started using. But uh, I was personally not very satisfied and I was a bit, you know, uh, uh, find initially I was finding it a bit difficult and most of my students were also finding it difficult because, you know, I... Uh, uh, I'm heading of the department of language journalism, where most of the students who are coming, uh, especially in Hindi and Urdu and many other language journalism courses, they are coming from different social strata, particularly, you know, the students are coming from socially, economically, uh, you know, uh, lower middle class, middle class families. And when pandemic struck and lockdown, you know, imposed and we have to conduct, uh, we were forced to conduct actually uh, online classes. Initially, most of the students, they don't have, you know, equipments or internet connectivity and there were a lot of problems. Most of the time we were forced to, you know, stop the classes because many of the students were unable to join uh, uh, and there were a lot of problems. So as um, uh, Amrishji was saying, uh, we were sending reading material through, you know, email and, you know, discussing over phone or uh, sending a lot of, uh, you know, question answer through WhatsApp and other things. It was really very tiring, uh, uh, too much time taking. But uh, after that, you know, uh, when we started our next academic year, uh, of course, pandemic disrupted ev everything. And, uh, you know, uh, our academic session started very late, almost three months late. Uh, we, we were um, able to start academic session in November. And when November, you know, there were some government regulation also to not to use Zoom while we are, you know, conducting this conference on Zoom. But here in India, in most of the government institutions were asked not to use Zoom because there were some you know, uh, 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 reports that Zoom, uh, there is some Chinese investment in Zoom and so it was not allowed. So we, right now we are using, you know, Google Meet, um, synchronous as well as in, in, in synchronous classes. Uh, but mostly it's, it's my experiences. I have a lot of questions and we'll deal with it. But, you know, personally, uh, after, you know, almost one year, I can share a few insights about my personal experience uh, about online classes. Uh, the first, you know, lesson is we, uh, we have not innovated or thought about it. And we have just shifted the face-to-face -face class to the online mode. That's all. Uh, so we are still, you know, unable to understand and innovate and, you know, plan something which is completely digital and online and which is, you know, suitable to this, uh, you know, mode of uh, uh, teaching or training. Secondly, you know, after almost six months of online classes, almost every day, uh, four to five hour classes, what I'm facing is, you know, <laughs> Uh, a kind of, uh, you know, fatigue, uh, weariness uh, among our students, as Jatinji was saying, that most of the students uh, now 
as a protest also you know uh, or as a some kind of uh, uh, you know their dissent as well as you know their their uh, you know frustration they are not uh, they are most of the time they are you know switching off their videos and uh, even if you encourage if you ask them to interact ask question uh, you know uh, in level of interaction is really really very low that is my personal experience uh after uh, one year secondly you know uh, uh like uh, in this conference also many of you may be facing uh, interrupted uh, you know uh, 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 this, uh, you know videos or audios and a lot of time what i'm saying some of may be going to you some of it may not be going to you so it's these inter on you know interrupted classes interrupted you know digital uh, uh, communication it's not really a conversation i am lacking that warmth uh, you know the close closeness and you know uh, uh, and also in face to face what, what i was you know uh, feeling as a teacher it is not we are not just a loyal mediator between Uh, a, a textbook or curriculum and the students uh, we are something different teachers role is bit different they are mentors and uh, i personally think in online teaching uh, it, it's it's a basically as jatin was saying it's a performance and you know uh, some somehow you are delivering what you know most of the time nowadays it's a monologue uh to a screen and while most of the students who are sitting for 3 or 4 hours it's their weariness they are tired uh they are not very engaged with the whole process and so uh overall what i personally think that you know uh, my personal experience is somehow we are managing as you know most of the other professional in other businesses and industry uh, they are fulfilling their task uh they are you know uh doing something uh to complete the courses and to conduct the examination and to deliver the degrees uh we are just reduced uh, uh from a, a teacher or faculty who, who who is basically a kind of a mentor uh you know friend of his students now how just uh, you know uh, uh, someone uh, sitting distantly from the students and delivering some monologue and some knowledge uh, and and not inviting uh, to the conversation uh, to our students so initially i would like to uh, you know uh, uh, keep my in- initial remarks uh, uh, to to this point we will you know discuss more points uh, after this thank you thank you anand ji uh- now i would like to invite uh, sharon uh, for her uh, opening uh, comments thank you everybody good evening and salam sejahtera from malaysia um in malaysia and i i really i i concur with what anand was talking about um in malaysia um the closure of schools and universities started march 18th last year and it affected some 4.9 million schools and 1.2 million uh institutes of higher learning and a lot of our students um they found it very difficult to adjust to the change for myself and speaking for my university i believe that because we are 20 years old we have a fairly young private university uh we had already started equipping ourselves for online learning uh some 13 years ago and um we had used video conferencing platforms for this but we never in our wildest imagination thought that the pandemic was going to get us totally totally at home uh with our screens uh i i i must say this on a personal basis that i haven't gone into a classroom since march last year um because uh my university particularly uh has been adhering to government regulations and so on so i haven't seen a classroom since march 18th last year um saying that i think in in my university uh at university tungkab rahman um or utah uh e-learning has become the buzzword 
And uh, every semester since the inception of the university, we've had a component called e-learning. And uh, in our key evaluations every year, um, our directors, our president, our, our superiors want to know how have we incorporated e-learning into our programs, into our courses. And, you know, in some ways we have done those through perhaps, you know, some quizzes or some basic, uh, you know, Facebook time or something like that. What has happened now is the fact that we have totally switched it to web-based video conferencing uh, using Zoom, using Microsoft Teams, uh, using Google Classroom, and it's very synchronous and asynchronous. Why do I say this? It's because uh, the synchronous, um, you know, if you need to do synchronous learning, then you need stable connectivity. And so a lot of my students, particularly um, when they came on board, uh, there were a couple of them who uh, had issues ha ha being co connected to the class. And so we had to find other ways of allowing them uh, to stay connected. For instance, we recorded our lectures or uh, we had um, we sent them uh, vi recorded videos on their phones or it would just be slides, the traditional way of doing slides and then having a voiceover. So I think it's interesting what Anand was saying that our roles have changed um, to the point that it's not just as an academic, but I find myself being a technician, being uh, a counselor, because there are students in the beginning who would come in and say, you know, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to deal with this. And I remember in March, April, May, right up till probably August or something, um, I used to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day, just screen time, um, because I students would suddenly say, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to submit my assignment. I don't know, you know, so this this is something that uh, that I guess it's it's exhaustion and screen fatigue to the maximum uh, of 12 hours, sometimes 15 hours. And but, you know, as academics and being passionate with what I do, um, I felt that I needed to guide my students. I needed that as much as I, they were learning, I was learning too, because at the same time I was learning how to use certain technologies. But I found that, you know, uh, along the way, um, there was an issue because schools, as in, you know, primary schools and secondary schools, they had issues with students connecting as well. So what happened then was there were a lot of organizations like telecommunications organizations or, or non-government organizations were offering schools and universities and students in general packages, uh, um, you know, um, 15, 20 gig, uh, gigabyte of, of data uh, free so that they get to access uh, their schoolwork, for example, and our students were no different. Um, so that was that was an issue. I think the biggest challenge even right now is, is screen fatigue. Um, I still have students who shut their cameras. I think it has a lot to do with, um, and, and I've said this many times amongst my colleagues, um, it's, it has a lot to do with the private and, and public space uh, of previously being in a classroom, physically being in, in a classroom where you would go in maybe for a two hour lecture, you would give your lectures, students would ask questions and everybody leaves for their own separate um, platforms, uh, their own private lives. But now with screen, you find that you are in their living space as they are in your own. And so they found, I think they find that, uh, and, and you, we have a few students here, uh, maybe later you can, you can comment on this, but I find that um, in conversation with my students, um, I've asked them this question and they say, yeah, I don't want my lecturers to see where I live. I don't want them to know that I'm lying on my bed or, or you know, having a meal or, uh, you know, what I look like and, and I don't need my lecturer there. This is my private space. And so that has been an issue. I think that has been one of the issues of switching off video, for example, um, and, and not allowing us in as academics into their life. And that has contributed to the fact that we all, you know, like what Jatin says, 
most of the time the screen is shut and you see nothing. Uh, and it's funny because one of the things I do is I have a mirror right in front of me right now um, that I look at myself every now and then uh, to, to remind me that I'm speaking to someone, although it's myself, but, <laughs> but uh, it's a way of connecting. And I think that is something that we lack, even though we are on screen and we see our students, yes, but the physical connectivity is lacking. And um, I think that's one of the, the human touch that, that we lack as academics. I mean, we are academics after all, we are, we are trained to be in a classroom and to, to meet students. And one of the things also is the interpersonal communication that lacks because, uh, you know, in a lecture hall, for example, you could see a student and you know the student is, isn't paying attention or you know it's, it's time for a break. And uh, another thing that I've done, and I've done so many different, I've experimented over the, the whole year with different things. And in Malaysia, with especially with my students, I can add one more role, Anand, uh, and the fact that, you know, you have to perform. It, it's, a, it's a large theatrical performance, uh, if I may say so, a the theoretic, you know, it's, it's, it's like you're putting up a show um, with your background and your lights, um, uh, you know, even for this session, I will tell you, uh, I have my screen, I have my ring light, uh, you know, and, and, and you dress up. And I, I do this because I, I've told my students that it, I want them to know that I've taken the effort to be in this class with them. And to some classes, to some senior students, it has helped. I see a lot of student, senior students seeing that effort and they have put that effort along to come into class and, you know, looking presentable or having a nice screen or whatever. So I think this is a, you know, it, it has caused, the pandemic has caused academics to not just be facilitators and teachers, but also great performers. And uh, I, I teach a three hour class um, uh, and um, it's a theory class and uh, I have two breaks. And I've tried many things, quizzes and asking questions. I've tried spin the wheel like Wheel of Fortune. Some classes it works, some it doesn't. But one thing that has worked with Malaysian students, especially with mine, is playing music that they like. And so, uh, Anand, I can say that I've also become a resident DJ uh, in my classes uh, to the point that I would relate my lectures to a particular piece of music and they would comment on it and we'd relate to the topic of discussion. And it takes a lot of effort. And when effort is put in, it's exhausting. Uh, not just the screen time, but also the fact that you're trying to interact and you're trying to get students to engage. And I think that is the biggest issue with academics behind the screen. I'm going to leave it at that for the moment because I know there's so many questions and so many comments. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Jatin. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, uh, there are patterns that are emerging, uh, but we will complete uh, the first uh, round of opening comments and then we'll start digging into that. Uh, now, while we are doing that, I would invite students to uh, uh, to provide your experiences, uh, you know, in the classroom situations, especially how you relate to your professors or, you know, why you switch off your videos or, you know, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, and that would help us uh, move forward in a way that is relevant to you because, uh, you know, after all, it's all about you. So please do that. Uh, now, uh, uh, I would invite Zach uh, to share his opening comments. Zach. Yeah, thank you very much and I'm um, grateful for the opportunity and good to see you all. Um, as you said a few minutes ago, Jatin, I think there are emerging issues that really cuts across. And it's largely because when you look at our various jurisdictions, we all share a lot of things in common. And so sometimes our challenges are almost the same because when I was hearing from Sharon, I was hearing from her, I was thinking, well, are we in the same country? was like we are almost facing the same problems. But yes, we had the same issue. So in Ghana, we frankly uh, don't have any online policy at all. And in my school, uh, we really haven't actually had any opportunity to do online uh, learning. So when the COVID struck and we had to uh, uh, go on a lockdown, we only had less than 24 hour notice to go on lockdown. And it was full scale lockdown where everything was shut apart from essential services. And at that time we were in the middle of the lecture 
and we had to go online. And you can imagine, we didn't prepare, we had no facility to deal with that. We really didn't even have any policy. So it was a makeshift uh, uh, arrangement. Quickly lectures were supposed to figure out how to continue with the lectures to avoid interrupting uh, the semester. So what we did was that uh, we made use a lot of uh, Zoom, but we live in a country where the internet penetration is very low. It's only concentrated in the urban centers. And this is a situation where a lot of our students had to leave and go back to their homes and some of them were in the rural areas. Some of them didn't even have access. And yet they were supposed to join online and continue with the uh, classes. So some of them couldn't come online at all. I was teaching about five different classes and the average in my class was about 120 students, 100 students. And when we started at the initial stages, I never had more than 25 in the class. Never had more than 25. And they genuinely want to come and board, but they didn't have the opportunity to do so. Some of them were in areas where there was no electricity, let alone thinking about having what? Internet. And those who were even in areas where the internet was there, the internet was wholly unstable. Some of them too couldn't afford the, uh, the cost of, of, of getting online. So what we did was that we tried to innovate and see whether the school could come in and assist them with some data. But that also was a challenge because it was more or less like a knee-jerk reaction because it wasn't thought through. So we faced a lot of challenges in terms of the connectivity. Some of the lectures ourselves were also facing challenges because some of the lectures had not actually had the opportunity to do any sort of online learning or teaching or even conference, and yet they were supposed to do. So you find some lectures being frustrated, the students were frustrated, and it really affected the, the relationship. But after the first few uh, uh, weeks, I think we started coming along and we started figuring out what to do. So we used uh, LMS, uh, we use Google Meets, we use, but we use uh, uh, Zoom a lot. But because there was no advanced preparation, it meant that a lot of the lectures had to actually use the Zoom through their own personal uh, accounts. And there were problems of the limited, you know, uh, duration that you could get. So for instance, at the initial stages, I would have a lecture that, is, that spans two hours, but after 30 minutes, I have to go off and then get them to connect again. And when you're going to reconnect, you lose a lot of students uh, 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 as you go along. But somewhere along the line, we got management to start uh, 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 arranging for data and all those things. Now, after everything had actually settled down, we had the issue of the interactions with the students. And some students were not aware, and some of them ended up embarrassing themselves because some of them connected with their videos on, didn't know that the videos was on, didn't know that their, 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 their uh, microphones were not unmuted, and we could pick up all the conversations they were having in their domestic settings. And some of them were in very compromised positions that ideally shouldn't come out there, you know? And it was really, really, really a big challenge because some of them didn't have any orientation about what these things were supposed to be. And I think Sharon raised that, and I think that would come up. So it actually exposes to a lot of other issues. What are the legal challenges, you know? Because sometimes you want them to put on their cameras so that you can see the real students there, but can you really uh, uh, force them uh, can you actually, is it, man, can you mandate them to put it on? How, to what extent can you do that? How does that go to the issue of privacy? You are trying to come into the privacy of their homes and all those things. And mind you, uh, when you look at those of us who didn't have any policy on online learning, when the students were enrolling, actually, when you look at the agreement between them and the institutions, the agreement was to have a face-to-face -face lecture. But this is a situation where now you are asking them to do online. That is a variation of the contract, if you like. But every contract can be affected by, you know, unforeseen circumstances and especially uh, 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 natural things that leave. So this is a situation where even if the contract didn't make provisions for that, it can be varied. But the notice period was very short. The students didn't get to prepare. Lectures didn't get to prepare. So there were a lot of legal and ethical challenges as we go along. Uh, we faced a lot of problems when it came to assessment. How do you assess the students? The issue of the integrity of the whole process and then the recognition that would be given to certificates that are, was acquired as a result of that. Our regulator didn't really have any provision in place to recognize that and students were worried that, I mean, if you are not careful, uh, the weight that would be attached to the value of our certificates 
that would be generated as a result of online learning would not be high and that would affect us in the market. So there was a lot of challenges, but I must say that after a few uh, 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 sessions, we realized that online learning has come to stay and that was an opportunity. So we, as a result of that, now realize that, okay, fine, we have to come up with a policy that would recognize online and face-to-face -face learning. In any case, when you look at the scenarios that online education actually exposes our students to, these are situations they would face in the real market. So we need to start thinking about providing them of those transferable skills. Because when they go in the job market, they will be conducting conferences online, they will be doing workshops online, they will be granting interviews online and all those things. And I think that this is something that we have recognized. And now, even now that we are no longer the easing, the, the lockdown has been eased down a bit. We've just started our uh, second semester, but we've decided we're going to do four weeks face-to-face -face and then five weeks online just so we give the students the opportunity to be able to learn the transferable skills. And we've made provisions for some of the challenges we face, but those challenges would continue to actually unravel themselves in different formats, because sometimes some of the challenges are just coming up, but we need to, as academics, uh, lecturers, and then institutions to have the flexibility and humility uh, to accommodate some of these challenges and not see it more as a burden on us, but see it as an opportunity to do things differently because the more we do things differently, the more we will be doing things that is in line with the 21st century way of exposing our students to learning because the learning has to move away from the theory and it has to be the practical. And that was one of the challenges I faced because I was teaching some of the courses that basically I needed to do things practically. But how do you do things practically when students are at different places? I wanted to put students together uh, as a team to go and observe activities in court because I was teaching them court reporting. And I wanted them to go to court and observe how things were going to be done, but they really couldn't do that because we were in lockdown. And even when the lockdown was eased down, people couldn't come down because they just can't travel from their villages and come to Accra just to go to court and then spend money and go back again. So there were a lot of challenges. And I think that it is a failure of some of our institutions to actually think outside the box. But the COVID actually, uh, unfortunate as it is, has actually exposed us big time in terms of the way we use technology to impart knowledge. And I think that just, I'm sure my other colleagues would attest to the fact that our institutions all over the world are now doing things differently uh, as a result of what COVID has uh, exposed us to. So I'm sure during the question and answers, we'll have the opportunity to explore some of the peculiar challenges and how we have individually found a way around it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. Uh, so thank you, Anand, Sharon, and Zach for your opening comments. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I noticed that we are starting to get comments uh, from, uh, from our audience. Thank you, Ashmeet, for uh, Ashmeet Kaur for your comment. And uh, I got, uh, I see a comment from Anita. And we will discuss, uh, the, you know, these observations. Uh, so uh, while we get into that, one thing, uh, you know, that I noticed, uh, or one pattern that emerged, uh, was the idea of uh, uh, of economic status uh, rural people in rural area people who are not so rich uh, may not have access to uh, internet or the tools or technologies to access um, you know this uh, this environment to the same degree or with the same degree of ease as uh, many other people uh, might have and uh, the issue of digital divide it's it, it's a big issue. It's uh, you, sometimes you think that you won't find it in developed countries, but even in United States, I have students who are facing uh, these issues. A lot of students actually. So uh, there was this student, and there are so many students like uh, him or her. So there are these students who uh, who went back home. So in United States, many students fund their own education. You know, they take educational loans and they pay their own fee and their own uh, living cost during education. So uh, many students, when, uh, when the hostels were closed during the lockdown or dormitories, as we call them here, many students went back to work. So they, so they tried to find work. They went back to work. They were working in different places uh, just because they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have resources to, uh, to fund themselves. And during that time, if you were having uh, classes, they would be, you would be expecting to use mobile data, which is very expensive in the United States. 
and that was a problem. Similarly, there were other issues. For example, there are students who, when they went back to their homes, had to take care of, uh, of their siblings. Many of them have children of their own. They have to take care of children of their own at home. So, so, so outside the classroom, so when we bring students into our classes, we expose them to a similar environment. You know, so they, they use the same kind of equipment, they sit in the same classroom, but as we go online, you know, the classroom disintegrates and their private lives come to the screen. Uh, so uh, now economic status is just one of the divides or one of the, uh, of the dividing factors that is there in society. In many of our societies, uh, especially in the global south, especially in developing countries, uh, resources, there has been a history of differentially allocating resources based on gender. You know, uh, uh, the boy child having different kind of access to resources than the girl child. Uh, in India, it has been uh, a difference that has been there for a very, very long time. Uh, there are differences because of race in United States, uh, which might not be relevant in some countries, but in some other countries, uh, uh, there might be differences uh, because of religions. So some religions or religious communities tend to be uh, more affluent or more open or more, uh, let's say, uh, religiously consolidated, more service oriented, all those kind of things. So when you think about your students, when you think about uh, about uh, uh, about your classrooms, are there factors, uh, you know, beyond just social status or economic status uh, that play a role? So what kind of factors are there? Have you noticed something uh, that is playing a role in how students are able to connect to, you know, to online education environments? Uh, I would start, I would invite uh, Anand first, but, uh, uh, Sharon and Zach, please feel free to, uh, you know, to intervene, to add or to uh, ask questions, yeah. to counter questions. So starting with Anand. Uh, thanks, uh, Jatin. I think number of issues uh, already flagged by Sharon and Jack, and also you have flagged from your own experiences. Here, I would like to flag another issue. And I don't want to repeat those uh, you know, uh, uh, issues which were already raised by Sharon and Jack, and you have also shared your experiences. I would like to add another experience or the you know, uh, uh, constraint. Uh, personally, I think my own experience, and I have also you know, interacted with many other faculty colleagues and guest faculty. Uh, whom we invite from industry and, you know, those who are working in uh, different fields. Uh, what they are saying, uh, you know, one thing which is very interesting and I personally feel also, uh, you know, physical classroom is a kind of a very open, uh, liberated space where you can not only discuss what is there in textbook, or, you know, in, 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 uh, in a typical class where you make a PowerPoint presentations. But it's a liberated space where you can discuss a lot of things. Uh, something which is you cannot discuss outside the classroom or in a public places. Where the students can also freely ask a number of questions. And as you are mentioning in Global South, you know, the politics, the social issues, cultural issues, gender issues, so many things which are really, really very hot topics. Uh, you know, there are, you know, very polarized debates happening. You cannot imagine those debates coming on, you know, uh, online space. Number one, why? Uh, most of the time, you know, even our uh, uh, online classes are recorded because number of students who may not be able to join your classes num because of the number of reasons, uh, maybe, you know, digital divide in number of, because let's take the uh, case of India. You know, our students are uh, 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 sitting in UP, Bihar, many states, where in some states there may be power cut, you know, uh, load shading, uh, uh, no power at all. So they are unable to join class. So for them, we are you know, recording those classes so that they can, you know, later on they can uh, 
with their own age they can go through it so can you discuss all these things in class uh, which is recorded uh, i think it's very difficult number of my guest faculty who are brit critical and those who teach you know critical thinking and raise number of questions they were also very you know uh, uh, scared that what i am going to talk you know uh, these days in a very polarized debate and cancel culture you know what may you know flare up nobody knows so that is one huge hindrance where now it forces most of the teachers to play according the, to the rules and that's the huge problem for teaching you know uh, while uh, another issue i would like to flag here jatin i think you would also uh, agree with it uh, you know teaching and training or classroom uh, discussion engagement cannot happen only you know limited to the syllabus or curriculum or subjects mm-hmm. uh, it has direct relationship uh, with what is happening in and outside your classrooms okay uh, and particularly in journalism and mass communication so suppose uh, the, the whole world and your own country is going through pandemic uh, it's very devastating uh, millions of people are struggling for oxygen uh, you know beds uh, thousands of you know you know um, dozens of your own students and their family members are struggling and in classroom you are not able to discuss all these issues and you cannot discuss you know issues related to uh, you know government failure and many other things which is also very important in the context that how your own media is reporting about it you know uh, what are the things which they are lacking in reporting you cannot discuss all these things and your whole teaching age so you know mechanical uh, because you are unable to discuss all those things so i personally think these are the crucial issues apart from what you are flagging you know digital divide is of course a huge issue for uh, uh, developing countries like india even in delhi you know which is a capital city in number of you know places and areas where i student mostly you know uh, 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 areas where uh, with they can get uh, you know cheaper rooms uh, they find it difficult to you know uh, get a good internet connectivity they are unable to find, uh, buy a new laptop or you know number of softwares think about you know you are training them in your lab i hear they have you are expecting that they should buy a, a, you know uh, software or you know find software to work on those you know projects or assignments and on the other hand there is a pressure from your own administration to organize exams to you know conduct you know do a lot of assignments so is is really you know a very difficult uh, i am very critical to this online uh, you know ed- education and teaching uh, and and with all these issues i think i don't want to go on and on uh, allow other friends also to come in thank you uh, thank you anand uh, for sharing uh, you know especially the concerns about privacy and i think uh, zach was talking a bit about that you know anything we say is recorded so pretty much everything including this conference you know you don't know who is watching it who is recording it and uh, all those kind of issues and uh, yeah. i i've been getting some comments from uh, from our audience uh, uh, so there were ashmi and uh, anita who talked about digital divide uh, uh, kiran uh, bala she also talks about uh, digital divide uh, shriya talks about uh, the social life how it has you know change so it's uh, you know universities or education higher education not only as a tool for instruction but also a social environment where you meet friends and and i i can uh, uh, empathize perfectly because most of my friends that i have you know that lasted like pretty much half of my life i hope i you know this is the half point but uh, most of them came from educational institutions or institutions of higher education people i met in universities during my masters during my mba or during my phd so uh, i do uh, relate to that uh, aditya asked a very important question 
and that is that institutions are charging extra tuition fee for online education. Uh, it seems like exploitation of students because online mode is cheaper than offline mode. And that, and remember, that's a question that has been there across the world, even in United States. So, for example, in my university, uh, enrollments went down. And uh, there were layoffs. So around 400 people, so 300 to 400 people uh, lost their jobs so that the universities you know, can sustain financially. Now, uh, they wanted to give you know, similar kind of salaries to their professors or their workers who are still remaining. People took furloughs, so they took salary cuts, uh, you know, to different extent across the country. And even then, because the enrollment went down, they still had to charge the same amount of fee to make that work, to keep the education system intact or to, you know, to, uh, for the institution to survive. But it seems pretty unfair if you are not delivering the same amount of content, same amount of service, then why should be there... Uh, you know, the same amount of fee. So that's a very important question, Aditya, and uh, we will definitely talk about it. Uh, we will explore different sides of the issue. Uh, maybe we won't have a perfect answer for you, but these are questions like this. Uh, you know, these are complicated questions. Uh, Pramod Pandey, uh, he asked that how you convince the students that this is the new normal and online education is here to stay. Uh, a lot of times students are thinking that they will go back to the old normal, but that might not happen. Or when you normal, where online education is a bigger social element. So, so these are the things, these are the themes that are coming up from our audience. Uh, 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 so, uh, we will uh, move to Sharon and then to Jack. So Sharon, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think uh, one of the things is um, the digital divide. As much as the government in Malaysia and the other, other organizations have kind of helped students uh, to access Wi-Fi or data uh, to, to be connected with their, with their teachers, I think the problem is also uh, the fact that in each household, not all of them are, have access to the hardware. For example, a family of uh, maybe four, uh, you know, two kids, for example. Um, I have had experiences where the student tells me uh, she cannot attend an eight o'clock class because her brother uh, has to use the computer uh, to access his class. And so she says, I can only come for your tutorials, for example, or whatever class that you have after lunch, because in the mornings, my brother has to use the computer. So there's this issue of even hardware, accessibility of hardware, or, you know, four people sharing one handphone in a home. Uh, so, so that is a, also a problem in Malaysia. Uh, another thing is also, you know, uh, the fact that the connectivity, as much as you get data, as much as you have Wi-Fi, I think one common um, uh, thing, and, and, you know, I think it, even amongst us in this conference is, can you hear me? And we use that phrase all the time. Can you hear me? Uh, because we want to know that we are here, heard clearly, our connection is clear, there's no static, there's no choppiness and so on. And, and half the time we are asking our students that same question, like, can you hear me? Am I clear? Is there distortions and things like that? And that kind of disrupts the flow of the, the lectures as well, uh, with, the tutu, with the students as well, because the students are also asking us the same thing. Can, can you hear me? Am I loud enough? Is there disruptions? And and that takes up quite some, some time of, of that flow that you have. If you were in a physical class, obviously, you wouldn't be asking these questions. Another thing is also, um, as much as Jatin, you mentioned uh, the fact that, you know, with the digital divide, you have problems with uh, gender or with economics, you have problems. Another thing I notice in my classes is also, is also geography. Uh, I have a lot of China students, students from China who, who, who study online with me. And there are a lot of um, apps and a lot of uh, social media platforms where they are not allowed to access um, 
And so it makes it very difficult for me and for the student because for Malaysian, I'll give you an example to this. For Malaysian students, we have access, and I'm sure with even in India and in the US, uh, the students have easy access to Facebook. But in China, uh, there is a, a kind of a regulation that does not allow them easy access to uh, Facebook. And so as much as I would want to post some questions or, or get, you know, using it as an informal platform for students to discuss and things like that, that is not possible for certain students because they cannot have access to it. They have a lot of applications or, or platforms which we are not familiar with because it's in a different language or we just do not have the, it's, it's not easily accessible, uh, if you know what I mean. So geography could also be an issue. Um, there are also students, uh, and, and uh, Jatin, you may know this, um, uh, some applications and social media platforms are very popular in Malaysia, but it's not popular in the United States, for instance, like WhatsApp, the mobile uh, application, uh, which is not really very popular among students in uh, the United States. So when I had a class with students from the United States, they had to kind of learn how to use WhatsApp because they would prefer using uh, Facebook Messenger. So these are, I think, some issues we need to deal with, especially if we have international students in our classroom. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Zach, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think this is a very fast, it is a fantastic uh, presentation. The issue, the issue came up about uh, students not connecting with their friends. I think that is one of the, one, it's a very important issue because psychologically, when you wake up in the morning, and you leave the house and you're going to school, uh, you know that we are going to school, you come there, you interact with your friends, you move away from that domestic setting because sometimes just the environment itself has got its own stress and uh, you know challenges. So you just wanna move, you come to school and it's a different environment, it's an academic environment. But a situation where students find themselves in, the very, in their homes and uh, engaging with their colleagues, it came up as very stressful. And in terms of the divide, uh, uh, the sexual divide, uh, there is another indirect challenge to females. So for instance, uh, those who have children, young children, when they know they are leaving the home and going to school, they make arrangements for somebody to come and babysit the children and then they go to school. But now unconsciously, because they find themselves in the house, they don't make that arrangement. And then they are online and the children keep interrupting and you know, Sometimes some of us, the men, we always leave things to the women, which is unfortunate. Uh, but when I have had situations where uh, uh, I have, at, just at the time when I was asking a female student to make a contribution, that was when the, lady, the, the, the little one just jumped in and she was trying to push her away and she was not going anywhere. She was crying and you felt, she, you could see that she was embarrassed, but I was telling her, don't be embarrassed. We all have children and all those things. But these are some of the things that are real and we need to look at that. And then, then there was an issue that came up, you know, once the students were agitating that we don't have the resources to buy data to connect online, and so the school should help us. There was this argument by uh, management that, well, online education is cheaper because ideally you would have actually taken transports to come to school. And so by saving uh, uh, from that transport cost, you should use that to buy uh, 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 online medium. But that was a very cynical position adopted by management because frankly, I thought, well, no. Because see, and one of the things that some of the students were saying is that because our parents know we are at home, they're not giving us money for transportation and they are not making provisions for uh, uh, data. Because sometimes some of these children are from homes where both parents have no formal education whatsoever. So they don't understand these things. All they know is that they are on lockdown, they are at home, and you are now asking me to give you money to do what? And mm. it was like, there was mistrust between the parents and the students and all those things. And, and, and we are there as uh, administrators of education and we are being cynical and we're thinking economics, you know, but the pandemic exposed everybody to unanticipated challenges. Governments were making sacrifices. They were giving people discounts, in Ghana, we were having free water for a, a period of time. Electricity was rebated and all those things. And yet you have academic institutions, they don't want to go into their internally generated fund to make some sacrifices. And I thought that was really, really 
uh, shameful and embarrassing. And that was also an ethical issue because the ethics of whether or not you are actually or, uh, giving prominence to economics over the education of students, which by and large is a, is, is a fundamental human right issue. And so we had those issues. So what we did, we did in Ghana is that, especially for those in the primary level and the secondary level, we adopted radio and television because they have more penetration. So we're using radio and, 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 and television. But mind you, there are some places where television is a luxury for them. They don't have it. And all those. So the challenges were, 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 were enormous. And then there was the issue of the privacy. And Jatin, you, you mentioned that the issue of data protection was there. You know, the issue of you taking so much information from you, who is handling that? You know, where is it going to end? And sometimes we didn't even have the humility as administrators to ask for permission. And you know, sometimes some of these online mediums, each of them can actually see each other's contact details and all those things. And sometimes they don't want to share that with people. If it's in the face-to-face -face classroom, they can choose who they give their contact number to and who they shouldn't give it to. But this is a case where they can now assess it and all those things. So those, those were issues. And then us as the lecturers, when we, we moved online and we were now supposed to uh, produce materials uh, uh, tailored for online, the issue was who owns the copyright came up. You're asking me to put in a lot of effort and all those things. And then uh, 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 managers were saying, well, Anything you do in the course of your work, the employer actually owns a copyright to it. But this is a situation where lecturers were being asked to go over and above what they would ideally do. And they have no stake in the intellectual property that they're generating. And that was also another issue. And there were issues of online learning in the, in, in the way it came because of the short notice. It led to people being harassed online. Some of their colleagues were actually sending them, you know, personal messages online and harassing them and all those things. So there were all those issues that came about as well. And 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 then 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 the issue of um, the, the 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 exhaustion, people having mm -hmm. to sit online and be facing the screen and all those things. There were some softwares where you could take a break. Uh, you know, and then, get, but but then, if you the lecturers themselves were not familiar with that pro, uh, uh, provision, the students didn't know. And sometimes, when you make an attempt to go a break, you don't get people coming back. So, in as much as some of the lecturers knew that these were challenges, we ignored them for our own convenience. We were not thinking about uh, uh, the students in that regard. So, for me, I think these are a number of challenges that come across. What I always say is that I think we need to have the humility and modesty to realize that you know, the dynamics have changed and we need to find a way of investing because the investment too was not there. People don't want to invest, institutions don't want to invest in, in, in making life easier for everybody. They think that uh, 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 the, the students are asking for too much, which I think it isn't. Now there was a question there as to how do you convince students to know that online education has come to stay? And what I always say to my students is that, listen, now in the job market, these are the tools you would need in the job market. So see online education just beyond passing your exams. See it as a valuable transferable skill that you are gaining. And then that would be useful for you in the online market. And I think we need to start conscientizing each other. And that. But I think we need to have the flexibility to adapt to different situations and talk to each other outside our boundaries. The tragedy is that we say now we are working boundaries, but we don't talk to each other outside boundaries. So we are trying to reinvent the wheel in Ghana when it's possible that Sharon had gone through that and she had actually overcome that challenge that I'm facing now. Or I could talk to Anna and Anna would say to me that, Zach, when we had that challenge, this is how we went about it. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel. But we don't talk to each other. And I think that is the tragedy. And I think we need to start looking at this. Thank you very much. Jatin, if you don't mind, I would just want to tag on to what Zach was mentioning. Um, the fact that uh, one of the things he said is, you know, how uh, students, they were in their homes and they, are, uh, they had children to look after. Um, and I think in Malaysia, we had a lot of cases where, where parents, when they felt that the student was no longer in the university and they were at home, sent them out to work, even though classes were going on and it was online because uh, of the situation, the economic situation. So the parents, what they did was they sent the kids out to work and say, okay, you can go and earn your own income. You know, you're old enough to do that. Um, so I had students who, while working in a convenience store, had to also 
follow along with their lectures. So that was something uh, of a challenge okay. for the student because, you know, in between, uh, when we had a discussion, she would say, hang on, I've got a customer. And so she would, would, oh. she would run off and do her own thing and then come back and say, okay, I'm back now. Let's continue with our discussion. So that's one of the challenges as well because that, that goes back to the economic situation of what was going on. The second thing I also want to tag on is... Um, as much as we're talking about how there's screen fatigue and all that, also to you know uh, a lot of um, academics who who are you know mothers at the same time, there's this work-life balance uh, that we struggle with. Uh, you know, we 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 work. I, I guess we work like kind of like 24 hours with our lectures and our homes, and and sometimes we wish that we are back in the university uh, so that we have that you know, uh, five, six, seven, eight hours of peace and quiet <laughs> from the home and just focusing on our academic teaching and whatnot. But that is also a challenge for academic women in academia, for example, uh, the challenge of balancing work and, uh, and life as well. So uh, these are some constraints. And I totally agree with you, Zach, the fact that, you know, in a lot of countries, and this is a great platform where we could discuss problems and issues and how to solve those problems instead of kind of, you know, uh, reinventing the wheel, we, we get to help each other with that wheel, with the, you know, so, so that's, that's a really good way of saying it. Yeah. Uh, Anandji, would you like to add something? Yes, I wanted to add one more point here, which is, I think, some part, uh, you know, uh, 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 from audience also highlighted it. You know, one of the key issue in you know uh, uh, media teaching and training is uh, certainly uh, you know the way student learn from each other. You know, they are coming from very different background. And in a classroom, which is a very inclusive place where the students are from different gender and, you know, geography, languages, social strata are coming and, you know, sitting together, learning with each other, what we call peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, that is also missing in online teaching and training, despite the fact that we encourage them to form groups, you know, and also go to breakout rooms and, you know, talk to each other, make presentation. But uh, still, I'm finding it difficult, you know, while earlier, uh, you know, in my institute, I met this, this is my personal experience, you know, uh, you were forming groups and those groups were with initial hiccups. Uh, there were some fight and then they, they, you know, start learning with each other and respecting each other. In online mode, I'm still, you know, struggling with the different groups and they are not finding it easy, you know, to work together, number one. Number two, what is I am also finding, uh, you know, difficult in online uh, uh, situation uh, is, you know, in in peer to peer learning, like in my institute, we, we have number of courses. So we have a specialization in advertising and PR. We have a, a specialization in radio and television journalism. We have a specialization in different language courses. And when students were in campus, they were interacting with each other with a different specialization. Now, because of the online classes, they are, you know, in a kind of a silos where they are not exposing themselves they are not you know sitting in in the in the in the dormitory and talking to each other or in their canteens or in their you know uh, different places within the campus so i think that is also a very key point where you know i from my own personal experience from my own student days i can you know vouch for it that i have learned a lot uh, outside the classroom, you know, which they are missing in the online uh, teaching and training mode. Uh, so here, of course, we are criti very critical to the online, you know, teaching and uh, training uh, uh, processes uh, and raising a lot of issues. Um, but I think uh, we must discuss these issues and challenges. Why? You know, because now the way online teaching and training was, uh, you know, in, 
enforced on us because of the COVID. That I realize and I accept. But now the governments are trying to, you know, uh, use this uh, occasion or opportunity to make formal, you know, uh, uh, classroom or face-to-face -face teaching and training, uh, um, you know, they're trying to change it. And in, in, in India, uh, recently UGC has issued a discussion paper where they are saying that even after this, you know, pandemic, uh, in future, you know, universities and institutions can, you know, keep 40% classes online and 60% face-to-face. So now they are making online, you know, teaching and training a uh, part of the overall university system. Earlier it was not. You know, occasionally you may have, you know, uh, some online lectures where, you know, you invite students in a big hall and then you know, some foreign, uh, you know, expert will come and, you know, deliver lecture through online. But now they are saying that even for, you know, regular course, you can have 40%, uh, you know, uh, element of online teaching. I think it will drastically change the whole uh, education scenario. And that's why we should, you know, thre discuss threadbare uh, the different consequences of online teaching. That's why I'm, you know, it, it may appear to my many of, uh, you know, audience members that we are so critical. We are only raising issues about, uh, you know, uh, uh, online teaching and training. And we are not discussing some of the good thing which is happening because of the online. But I'm raising these issues because, you know, there is a threat, there is a, a, you know, problem that government and regulators may, you know, use this opportunity to some kind of a mechanical uh, mix of 60% and 40% uh, of, uh, you know, teaching and training. So 40% online. Tomorrow they may can say, you know, it's, it, you can have, you know, 60% online teaching and just 40% classes. So how it will change, uh, you know, the uh, uh, education uh, um, overall, we must discuss all these things. That's why um, it may appear to many of our, you know, uh, audience members that we are so critical and we are only raising issues. Thank you, uh, Anandji. Uh, Zach, your thoughts? Yeah, I think you are absolutely right. But I don't think the criticism is just to discard the point that online teaching is not important. As I said, and I think Sharon alluded to that as well, online teaching has come to stay. And the benefits are huge. But we have to have to recognize that institutional administrators, the schools, the institutions would have to invest in that. And because without that investment, you really cannot gain the benefits that you want to gain out of that. But for me, I think online education has come to stay because apart from everything, what I realize is that it also gives people who ideally, who would not have the opportunity to get certificates to do so. Because some people are very tight, you know, working shadows and they cannot afford to come from morning to uh, early afternoon or evening in a face-to-face -face class. But if they have this hybrid system of learning, they can actually find a way of squeezing some time from their employers and do so. And I am saying that our policymakers will now even have to start getting to the stage where, because it would, it would surprise you to know that Ghana, we get independence in 1957, but we don't have any open university, any, any open learning uh, system. You know, everything is face to face. And there are a lot of people who want to acquire certificates, who want to acquire, who want to get formal education, but they can't do so because they cannot afford to leave their job because that is what puts food on the table for them. And yet they need the certificate. So you have people coming to me and saying to me, listen, I need to just get a certificate to be able to get an upgrade, to be able to get a promotion in my workplace. I can't leave the workplace and go and do it. My employer is not allowing to give me that flexibility. What should I do? And you look at this person and you think how unfortunate. So for me, I think that beyond just the hybrid system, we need to get to that stage where when we talk about real equality and equity in the provision of education, online education is one of the ways you can achieve that in a, an effective and efficient manner. But if you don't invest in it, it would be counterproductive. So we need to start investing in it because otherwise it creates bigger problems. And there was a very interesting thing that usually happened during the early stages. 
uh, this issue of can you hear me, can you hear me, that Sharon said. I was having a situation where at the point where I'm asking a group to present or I'm asking a student to give me a question, that's when the, their network goes back. And I was having, I was a bit cynical and I thought they were doing it on purpose. You know that, okay, why is it that it's only when I, I was asking you a question that your network, so it brought about some mistrust against me and the students. And it only dawned on me when it happened to me. When it happened to me in a conference, and Jefferson, you will remember that at the last conference that we had, just when it was my time to speak, my system went, it failed me. Meanwhile, I had prepared all day for the conference. And then just when it was time for me to speak, it went off. So I'm saying that as for online education, it, it's, it's now the norm, but it can only be the norm when we start embracing, because in Ghana, for instance, we have a situation where the regulator doesn't recognize online education. So even if you bring it in and people get education out of that, it's an issue. We had to do assessments uh, 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 online. And it is true that we didn't have the tools to check issues about plagiarism and all those things. So in as much as we know that this online uh, uh, assessment is not going to be purer than pure, we had no choice. So we had to get the students to do that. Now, employers out there are thinking, well, really, do I really want to recognize a certificate that people really got through an online assessment and all those things? But that's the reality. It's not the fault of the students that we haven't got the, 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 the resources to invest and, and put in place the mechanisms that would make sure that the assessment is actually above board. So I'm saying that, yes, Anand, I agree with you perfectly. There are a lot of benefits that both teachers and the students will learn from online education, uh, but we also have to invest in it. Investment from the institutional perspective, investment from the bigger policy directive from the governments, and then collectively, we can all work to achieve the desired impact that online education is actually throwing up to us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Zach. No, that's 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 that. That's it. Thank you very much, Jetin. I want help somebody else. Come thank you, Zach. Your yeah, your screen froze, and I thought you stopped. <laughs> and I think that's something that happens a lot in uh, on online interaction. That's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 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 So. So this is the last question, and then we will open it to audience. So what do you think is one major challenge? And what, like, what is one solution that you have figured out for any problem that you have faced during the online environment? For me personally, one of the bigger, uh, biggest challenge has been to establish credibility and authority. of times when I look at myself in the camera uh, and the lighting is bad or something is bad, we, we have never been trained to do that in a classroom setting, you know, never look for lighting and, and you think of yourself as a news reader. Sometimes you think that, all right, so if had I been a news reader, would people have believed me? And so a lot of times I listen to my recordings. Uh, one of the problems I face is that I speak you know, I say, I know a lot, you know, or you know a lot. So I would, and, and that has been a big problem. So, uh, and sometimes when I get a bit tense, so for example, I was listening to my, uh, you know, to what I said in yesterday's inauguration ceremony. So the lighting was bad. I'm, vi I'm visiting a friend and, you know, and I was nervous. So I said, you know a lot and you listen to it and, you know, and, and you feel really bad. Now that's something that doesn't happen in real life. So you are working working on a lot of things. So you are actually, so I am actually training myself the way a news, rip, like, you know, a news anchor would uh, probably do. And I would say that Ishika and Abhishek will probably do a better job and Freya and Yogesh of, you know, talking about the same things or, you know, doing the same, uh, communicating the same message. It's just because they have been trained in it. And we have rarely, you know, trained with that perspective. So, so that is, you know, one of my challenges and that's how I'm struggling to deal with it because remember it's it's new for everyone both teachers and students and students are dealing with things but then teachers are dealing with things too so uh, so your thoughts uh, starting with Anandji yeah uh, 
thanks i think you have raised a very interesting question um i have not reflected on it uh, certainly you know uh, uh, teaching uh, is a kind of a performance uh, either you know in a physical classroom or online classroom um, you know in 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 physical classroom also uh, uh, there are a lot of things uh, uh, we apply or we learn you know how to engage students even in physical situation uh, of course in online it's much more difficult uh, and also you know uh, i'm also learning a lot of things and still uh, i'm not able to use you know all the tools and techniques associated with these you know teaching platforms or google classroom there are so many things they are you know these uh, these platforms are also evolving uh, and trying to incorporate those things which we we were doing in our uh, you know physical classrooms but the bigger question as a teacher or a faculty which i am facing and you know finding it difficult to deal with is you know the role of a faculty member uh where my chamber in the institute were always open for students students coming they are you know most of the time coming and discussing lot of things including their personal issues uh and teachers role as a you know some kind of a therapeutic you know a mediator or you know mentor where you are guiding your student from your their personal to you know professional issues uh, most of the time they will come with you know number of questions related to their career you know their future path the uh, uh, issues they are struggling with which you cannot discuss in a classroom and particularly you cannot discuss in online you know uh, settings where the number of people are listening and you cannot have you know uh, so many you know uh, breakout session or individual one to one session like this so so i am personally struggling and i am unable to find any way to deal with it except what i started last year i started writing a longish email which i call you know new uh, you know a letter from course director it is generally 1000 1200 word long you know email where i would be discussing lot of things you know uh, uh from sharing some good articles published in newspapers to you know uh, some you know some students may have said something you know personally through whatsapp and i would generalize it and you know raising those issues personal issues mental issues because you know students were going you know severe mental depression also particularly during the second wave of covid number of student one of my students lost his father you know some of them uh, lost their you know close relatives and at that time i would writing those letters and discussing about grief and how to share grief and how to deal with mental trauma and what to do all these things uh, were part of that you know later and students would then individually respond and share their own issues so in a way i was trying to open them uh, for you know personal conversation as well which is i think as a teacher is a very important role of a teacher we are not just a someone who is delivering some cu- curriculum or delivering some textbook so i see role of a teacher is much much bigger which is a kind of a you know a, a very living relationship or you know very organic relationship with your students which i am missing in online and is still unable to you know devise strategy or tools or techniques or ways to deal with it thanks thank you anand ji sharan okay thank you very much um i think one of the challenges uh, i would face uh, is the fact that the interaction and the engagement with students like what we we talked about how students would shut off their videos and not want to interact with us i think it also depends on the kind of batches of students we have um i guess uh, first things first i just wanted to address what jatin said you know looking back at the video of us and trying to kind of create that credibility uh and just to share with everybody one of the things i did is um 
I get students. I I I guess there's there's this power shift. Um, when we were when we were in the physical classroom, we held the power to dictate how the class was going on. Um, academics had that power to control how and the style, the pattern, the content delivery, and so on and so forth. Now we're in a situation where we are on the same platform, whether we like it or not, same platform with our students. We are perhaps some of us are struggling with the use of technology or certain applications and just like our students. In fact, there is a possibility that we don't know a lot of things that the student knows because we are in uh, we are teaching in a uh, in in generation generation z which is between the ages of nine uh, those born in 1999 and 1995 to 2010 who are digital savvy and they know these apps so one of the things i do is every time i start a class i ask them what are some of the apps that the students use and they would say oh i use instagram and snapchat or tiktok or whatever and i try to incorporate that into my classrooms now of course some of you may be say, saying this app is not applicable to us in in my country for example then you've got to find a way of finding the app that the generation that is in your classroom is using or something that is attracting them to want to learn something. Why is it they get to learn how to do something on YouTube for that matter? Why is it that they get to see a short video on Instagram and are blown away? And why is it that they can't get blown away in our classrooms? So in for me, I feel that when, you know, Jatin, like you said, you, you tend to do a video and, and kind of get that broadcasting mode and for me i want to look at a youtube video and i do that i look at youtube video and i see what my students are, are watching and i tend to kind of replicate that that medium and see if that's going to attract my students and so i do things which because the generation that we are teaching are very much into popular culture and popular culture is one thing that is attracting young people and if you can incorporate popular culture with your into your classrooms some of your battles are won some of your battles, not all. Um, and so my biggest struggle, I can say, is the fact that, you know, as I said in the beginning, is allowing my students to switch on their videos and allowing them to connect with me as I would want with them. And I want to go back to what Anand said uh, of, of writing that long letter. Something that we have in our university is something called the academic advisor. And what I do is, so every academic is assigned a group of students and we see them through from year one right up till their graduation. We advise them, we talk to them, we talk about their careers, we talk about their problems and so on and so forth. So every semester we meet three times. And in these three times, we talk about everything they are juniors, seniors. I get them interact, interacting with each other. Uh, they are on my WhatsApp. They are on Telegram. We have personal conversations. And I think that helps because, and I tell them to address me with my first name as I would them. And it has become a platform of friendliness. Because I we have to understand also that these students struggle in trying to perform perform in class and trying to excel in class. Um, you will be surprised in my classroom, for instance, the ones that did not do well physically in the classroom seem to do better online because that would mean they do not have to speak in front of a crowd, for instance, if they are introverts or they could be very comfortable in their own living space and be able to present something because they are comfortable in their living space. So I guess depending on the different students that you have, that would be your biggest challenge. And that is my biggest challenge as well. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Zach? Yeah, thank you very much. And I think uh, one of the challenges I face, Sharon has just provided a clue as to how to go about it. Because you see, my classes are very interactive. I like to make it very, very, very interactive. And in class, uh, frankly, um, sometimes because of that, we have a hate love relationship with my students. Because once I come to the class and you don't talk, I will get you to talk because it's face to face. And I adopted something in class, which was very funny. So um, if this week I miss you, the following week, I'll try and get those who haven't really spoken in class. 
And sometimes I give the microphone to the colleagues and say, see, give it to somebody who hasn't spoken so far since the session started. And they will just hand over the microphone to one of their, their, their colleagues. And it's exciting. I don't get to do that in the online uh, session. Whereas I want it to be as interactive as possible, but they are hiding behind that unanimity. And you see, one of the challenges that we also face as lecturers is in class, you are in control per se, but online, you lack that ability of absolute control because sometimes that control is because you yourself, you're not too conversant with the technology. And sometimes you are not really in control of when somebody says something and when you can stop them and all those things. So those sort of things, but I think Sharon, I picked a clue from you about how you, you, you go about that. And I think that connection between students and lecturers is very crucial. Now, there was one thing that I found very challenging initially, you know, how to sometimes break the monotony of they having to listen to you as a lecturer throughout the whole uh, semester and all those things. And one thing I realized was that any time I bring in a guest lecturer, really, it, it, you know, it, it breaks that, that monotony and, and then they try to engage. And then after that, you, you get them to listen to that guest lecturer and then say that uh, subsequent lectures, you would build on Right. So I can't hear Jack. Jack. Yeah, I think Zach's uh, internet is uh, stuck. But I believe that uh, you know he was able to make uh, you his know point, a yeah. part of his uh, point, and uh, that was very well taken. So this is uh, you know so this is where we will uh, stop the formal uh, interaction. So I will invite. Uh, you know, Zach to finish his thought. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, we will, we have around 12 minutes. So we will take one question. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to post that in the chat window. We will go to Jack uh, to, uh, you know, to hear the rest of his thought. And then uh, we will take the question if we have uh, time to do that. Zach, please go ahead. No, I was just about wrapping up and saying that thank you, Sharon, for giving me a clue. Now, at least you see, this is the beauty of trying to connect with each other from all the device. And I'm saying that ultimately, the way Sharon gets to connect with a student is something I have to try and see whether it might work for me. If it worked for me, then uh, I would remain grateful to Sharon for that. But yes, I, I think the ability to connect with our students and make it as interactive as possible is very crucial. And that is really one of the challenges where you want to break that monotony uh, by, by, by giving them a break, but you are worried that if you give them a break, they might not be able to connect back. Connecting back is a problem and all those things. So those are some of the challenges. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, uh, we got, uh, you know, uh, so we had a lot of comments and I believe that uh, we have been able to discuss them uh, to some extent. This is uh, an ongoing debate. This is an ongoing conversation, uh, you know, and I hope that uh, we keep on talking about these issues, not only in uh, forums like this, but also outside uh, in our homes, in our classrooms, uh, not only among faculty or not only among academicians, but also among students and between faculty members and students. So uh, with that, uh, I would say thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Saxena and uh, Dr. Bala for being here uh, all the time and everyone else uh, with uh, your cameras switched off or on. It was uh, great to, uh, to meet you virtually. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jatin. Thank you very much for moderating. It. And thank you, Anand. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you to all of you. It's just a great uh, session. I learned a lot from it. And I hope we will continue to engage and, 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 and learn from each other. Uh, thank you from me, uh, you know, also to all of you, including Sharon, Jatin, and Jack. 
and all the participants and audience here who are quietly and in in some cases they were making a lot of you know interesting remarks and uh, uh, making comments and sharing experiences uh, those are very valuable comments thank you so much it was really really very interesting points and on some issues we have started reflecting on because you know jatin and many of you have raised those issue i have not thought about that you know and now uh, as a teachers or as a faculty members or as a researchers we should you know reflect what we are doing and in what context we are doing and what are the issues which are emerging and sharing those experiences with each other and also involving students in that process thank you so much uh, jatin sharon jack and ambrish ji and many other faculty colleague from dme i just want to say thank you as well uh, to the organizers and also jatin for having me on board uh to my panelists uh, zack and anand as uh, it's great to to be together with you on this panel um i've dropped my email in the chat box if you are you know wanting to share your ideas or you want to hear what we do at my university uh please feel free to email and uh we can have a session uh where we can talk more i think there's so much to be uncovered and like what zack said you know there could be some issues that uh we are facing that maybe some of us have dealt with uh and some of us can help each other to become better academics and better facilitators for our students so thank you very much thank you thank you so much it was indeed a very interesting very valuable session uh we have discussed about the implications of a uh, zoom platform google meet platform and various other online platforms here i would like to say or maybe add one thing that uh, after uh, with the, of course with the permission of my esteemed panelist uh, after all the discussion i have come up with the conclusion that of course uh, with this online platform we have also missed that cultural empathy within the classrooms say for example if i am talking as a mother of 8 years old daughter she was learning about various cultures in terms of food sharing food items once she was telling me that one of my classmates she always brought idli and uh, chutney in her lunch box the famous south indian food so she asked me that why she always bring that particular food item in the lunch box that day i came to know that personal interaction sharing of lunch box sharing of food it has an equal and important uh uh you can say that an impact on the holistic development of one student and similar is the case with the college going students when they are sharing their ideas their uh, style of their um, uh, dressing sense their fashion cultures or maybe their food items this cultural empathy is missing in this online platform so with this i thank you each and every one dr jatin mr zack uh dr pradhan and dr sharan to share valuable thoughts experiences with the various mode of digital platforms as well as the online teaching thank you so much over to you abhishek yeah thank you ma'am i would also like to thank dr jatin shrivastava dr sharan wilson dr anand pradhan and mr zakaria for such a valuable and honest opportunity to discuss on a very crucial topic thank you and now i would like to request Professor Dr. Sushmita Bata, head DME Media School, Delhi Metropolitan Education, to give the closing remarks. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. Thanks to all panelists. Uh, this interesting session and listen to everyone on uh, various aspect, experiences, and uh, obviously number of issues. Uh, I feel it's difficult. but uh, not so much uh, my point is this uh, problem is digital divide i think so uh, not uh, so much online online mode online classes so uh, because uh, before classes i share my notes and uh, forum is open for all so thank you thanks to all of you thank you so much ma'am for your appreciative words I would now like to thank all our guests for inspiring and informative session. I would also extend my gratitude to Professor Dr. Ambrish Saxena 
Dean DME Media School, Convener, ICANN4, and Professor Dr. Susmita Bala, Head DME Media School, Chief Convener for the ideation and planning of all the sessions. I would like to thank Ms. Manmeet Kaur, Dr. Manaswi Maheshwari, Mr. Mohammed Kamil, and Mr. Shruti Vyas for the constant support and guidance. I would also like to thank Mr. Ritik Ghosh, Mr. Sumantra Sarthi Das, Mr. Sachin Nair, and Mr. Yogesh Sharma for providing the overall digital operations for ICANN 4. I would now like to thank our entire team, all faculty members and students who have worked day and night facing all the challenges and obstacles of the pandemic in making this conference happen. I must also thank our participants who joined this session. Dear participants, your every bit of feedback is really important to us. And so we request you to not to forget to drop your valuable feedback on the link posted in the chat box. For all the new updates, stay in touch with us through our social media handles. The links are being shared in the chat box right now. And now, don't forget to visit the DME website and the ICAN4 micro website for any or any all details. Here we complete the day two of second edition of the world's first 10 day digital live international conference ICANN. We're looking forward to eight more days filled with knowledge, expertise, and deliberations on a diversity of topics. The session scheduled for day three, that is tomorrow, are a masterclass on fact checking presided by Mr. Pankaj Jain at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time. We will be having the second technical session on topic communication through cinema and social information at 11.30 a.m. IST. There's another masterclass plan on artificial intelligence in journalism by Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey at 3 p.m. IST. And then the final session for tomorrow is the unveiling of the book, The Practice of Public Relations by Ms. Catherine Lanconi at 6.30 p.m. IST. With an incitement to see you all tomorrow in these wonderful sessions, I, Ishika Vadwa. And I, Abhishek Bajaj, take your leave for today. Good night. Take care. Stay safe, everyone.